Hey there, metal fans. It's been a while since we dug into some obscure heavy metal classics. So today, we're gonna look at five 80s metal bands who only released one EP, plus one band who only released one controversial single. So put on some headphones and kick back as we check out some awesome EPs. But first, what exactly is an EP? Primarily used for promotion, an extended play album is under 30 minutes long and usually contains four to six tracks. They're typically something a band would release early on to help build a fan base, although obviously they can be released at any point in a band's career. And with that out of the way, let's look at our first band, Avalon. Avalon was formed in 1975 as Scratch by a group of kids in the Netherlands, with Eric Fox on vocals and guitar, Martin Fingers Hiskamp on guitar, Rutger the Butcher Hunks on bass, and Jacques Kral on drums, they'd eventually change their name to Avalon in 1979. Rutger would be replaced by bassist Jan van Dentren in early 1981, and in 1983, vocalist B.G. Richard Mermans and guitarist Jack Pisters, both from another local band called Morgan Le Fay, would also join Avalon. Jan would leave around this time, so Eric would move over to bass, and in 1984, this lineup would record a demo titled Maybe This Time. The following year, Jacques would be replaced by drummer Frankie Woodhouse, and along with Eric Fox on bass, Martin Hiskamp on guitar and keyboards, BG on vocals, and Jack Pisters on guitar, this lineup would record the band's one and only release, the third Move EP in 1986. Made up of three instrumentals and three full tracks, the third move is on the lighter side overall, but with ambitious guitar work, including touches of power metal, prog, and glam. The intro sets the tone with the guitar and synthesizer composition, leading into the first proper track, Dancer in the Eye of the Storm. In the eye of the storm. I love the unrelenting lead guitar in the background here, but the synthy bridge section with its sci-fi inspired lyrics leading into the solo is my favorite part of the track. But this is followed by the track that is almost guaranteed to get stuck in your head, The Excellent Hard Loving Man. It starts off with a calm, ballad-like piano opening, complete with passionate, melodramatic vocals. Is there a way for me to have But then the song kicks into high gear with a catchy as hell riff. Don't you know that I've been trying to do all of my head? My memories won't fade away. You always fail. Try to get to stop before they see. And then goes into a chorus with a lick that's even catchier. I'm buddy for you. The 
The guitar work throughout the album is outstanding and interplays nicely with the keyboards, but the guitar solos of course are fantastic as well and for me are a highlight on pretty much every track. And speaking of solos, the instrumental track Arabesque is up next, a bit of a Van Halen influenced shredder with lots of finger tapping. Then we have Perfect Illusions, another track I absolutely love, with opening lines that never fail to make me chuckle. But while the lyrics may be a little silly, it's all part of the appeal for me, along with another incredibly catchy chorus. Plus, Perfect Illusions has probably my favorite solo section on the whole EP. And if that's not enough, the EP ends with the epic instrumental, Necronomicon. While there is definitely a commercial side to the music, it's done really well, and the compositions are fantastic, with some cool classical touches. Martin would leave Avalon shortly after the EP, and they'd bring on a dedicated keyboardist, Giovanni Paleri. This lineup would record a demo in 1987, with session drummer Hank Menens replacing Frankie Woodhouse. I like these tracks, although they mostly lean far more into the commercial side, with an almost AOR feel at times. But the third track, Search for the Paragon, showcases some amazing synth and guitar work, giving an idea of where the band could have gone given the chance. Jacques Kral would return on drums after this, just in time for vocalist BG to leave. Along with some other lineup changes, Avalon would carry on with Peter Strikes on vocals for a bit, and then Mary Dreesen. But eventually, Avalon would disband in 1989. In 2006, though, the band would celebrate the 20th anniversary of the EP by playing a few shows with Martin Hiskamp, Jacques Kral, Jack Pisters, B.G. Richard Mermans, and second Avalon bassist Jan Van Dentren. 
they'd also release the final move, containing the remastered EP and tons of demo tracks, which I highly recommend checking out. Number 2. Dark Age Dark Age from Los Angeles, California was formed in 1983 and by January 1984 consisted of Jimmy Tiger on bass, Jeff X on drums, Johnny L.J. Isaacs and Alan Foley on guitar, and Robert Stevens on vocals. There is very little information on this band other than their one release from January 1985, the self-titled EP, Dark Age. This entire album is badass, including the epic fire-breathing dragon on the cover, and the fact that the two sides of the EP are called Side Tiger and Side Dragon. I'm not entirely sure what it means, but it totally fits with the aggressive power metal tracks and fierce solos. Plus, Robert Stevens has a great range for power metal, nailing tons of high-pitched notes. And the thick bass from Jimmy Tiger, also known as James McGurdy to Christian Death fans, adds to the heaviness of the songs. There's a nice variety on this short album, going from the merciful fadish second track to the straight up hard rock power of track three, Rock Revelation. This one has a bit of an early Iron Maiden vibe to me, especially in the last minute or so, with a terrific solo. Although the brief opening also gets a title, The Execution, track 4 is technically Messenger to Asheron. This one feels like a blend of King Diamond and Iron Maiden to me, but put through a US power metal filter, resulting in some phenomenal guitar playing. Next, we have the moment where I knew I loved this album. Warrior, come out to play. The Warriors is one of my all-time favorite movies, so this got a lot of points for me. And besides, the song itself is freaking awesome. The 
The guitar playing is still great here, although not as frantic as it is on other tracks, allowing the songwriting to shine on its own, as well as Robert's excellent vocals. Dark Age finishes strong with the high-energy album closer, Viper. Another merciful fate meets Iron Maiden banger. We have a video in the works with Chuck Woods for tentative release on MTV, and there's a discussion of a limited edition picture disc. We're also currently in negotiations for a European tour. The future of Dark Age, musically speaking, holds more intense, melodic, original, metallic, crunching metal. Sadly, it seems like none of that happened, despite releasing a killer EP. Dark Age did record a demo for a second album, though, which Roadrunner Records was allegedly going to release in some form, titled Tiger in a Cage. But that fell through as well, despite what sounds like more excellent material. From this live footage of Dragon Slayer, one of the tracks from the demo, it's clear that there would have been more of Robert's tremendous vocals and even more sensational guitar work. But unfortunately, only three years after forming, Dark Age would disband in 1986. Number 3, Hammer Witch. Originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, Hammer Witch was formed in 1985 by Wayne Abney on bass, Terry Sims on drums, George David on guitar, and Frankie D on guitar and vocals. This lineup would record a demo, but faced with a lackluster metal scene in the area, they decide to move to Fort Worth, Texas, and ideally an audience more open to their brutal riffs. In late 1986, Terry and George would move on to other projects and be replaced by guitarist Bo Tapausis and drummer Sal Tornio. But Bo would leave in early 1988 resulting in the three-piece lineup of Frankie, Wayne, and Sal. After establishing themselves with performances all over the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Hammer Witch would put out their self-produced EP, Return to Salem, in 1987. This EP maintains a power thrash aggression throughout all six of its tracks, with the perfect mix of exceptionally heavy riffs and compelling songwriting.
Not to mention some fantastically well-crafted speedy solos. The high energy attack of opening track burned at the stake is followed by the more straightforward groove of Psycho. Not only is the music great, but Frankie D's voice is a perfect fit as well, with what feels to me like a mix of David DeFay from Virgin Steel and Lizzie Borden. And of course, rounding out Hammerwitch's massive sound are Wayne Abney's heavy bass and Sal Tornio's powerful drums. Side 2 of Return to Salem crushes just as hard as Side 1, with head-banging cuts like Brainchild. And of course, the guitar work on here freaking shreds. It's hard to tell what exactly was holding Hammerwitch back with an excellent DP highlighting groovy thrash and Pantera only a couple years away from releasing their breakout album, Cowboys From Hell. But I feel like, similar to a band like Leatherwolf perhaps, Hammerwitch may have found themselves in a position where they were too heavy for the glam crowd, but a bit too eloquent for the hardcore thrashers. Regardless, this EP totally holds up for me with powerful aggression, a heavy as hell rhythm section, and phenomenal guitar playing that will still melt your face today. Following the release of the EP, Frankie would leave Hammerwitch as Wayne and Sal were looking to get even heavier with their sound. Wayne would take over on vocals, and he and Sal would be joined by guitarist Darren Kobatich. This lineup would attempt to put out a full album in 1991, titled Legacy of Pain. However, the label that had distributed the Return to Salem EP, Independent Records, was ironically no longer accepting independent artists. 
So unfortunately, past a few cassette tapes, Legacy of Pain didn't receive an official release. Which again is unfortunate because it's also pretty great, with an even more brutal thrash sound than Return to Salem. Wayne's gravelly vocals are a great fit for the thrashier sound, and Darren has a different guitar style than Frankie, but lays down leads that are just as intense. Legacy of Pain getting next to zero distribution, Hammerwitch would bring on second guitarist Scott Shelby in 1993 before finally disbanding in 1994. Hammerwitch did independently release Legacy of Pain on CD in 2010, so you can give it a listen. And in 2013, they reformed briefly to play a tribute show for Mike Scotia of Ministry and Rigor Mortis. <laughs> This lineup included Darren Kobatich on guitar, Wayne Abney on bass and vocals, and Anthony Walker on drums. Sometime after the tribute show, Wayne would form the band Life of Scars with Anthony on drums and guitarist Michael Hubner. So far, they've released one album, When the Devil Walks In, from 2018, and a single in 2022, featuring artwork by Darren Kobatich. Number 4 Nightmare. Nightmare from Hagen, Germany was formed in 1982 as Nightmare, but spelled correctly. With Siggy Schwartz on vocals, Jürgen Tetzloff and Ergen Tassli on guitar, Hani Platka on drums, and Reinhold Durand on bass, Nightmare would record a fairly mediocre three-track demo in 1983. After the demo, Nightmare would make some changes. Reinhold would leave, and Jürgen would move over to bass. He'd also change his name to the more American-sounding J.N. Thompson, and Hanny Plotka would become H.G. Plotka, and the band would also decide to switch the spelling of their name to N-Y-T-E. And then in 1986, Nightmare would put out their only release, the self-titled EP, Nightmare. The music is a little poppier than what you might expect based on the cover, and the album is fairly simple overall, but it's extremely catchy and features a nice mix of sounds, kicking off with an opening track mixing new wave of British heavy metal styled riffs with a power metal vocal melody. Then we get Evil In Your Eyes, with a little more of a mid-paced commercial feel in the chorus. And the solos on the album aren't what I would call super technical, but they're very nicely put together for what they are, and a highlight on every track. There's even 
a power ballad, Blackjack, which again is fairly formulaic, but nails it and adds extra variety to the EP. Blackjack for a lifetime, the Nightmare doesn't push any boundaries, and that's part of what I love about it. It's very straightforward metal with catchy melodies and solid guitar work that you can just rock out to. This one won't be for everybody, but if you're into lighter German metal with British overtones, I think there's a lot to like here. But along with the opening track, there is speedier stuff on here too, including track five with the headbanger, Love is a Game. And of course, there's another simple but effective solo. The EP wraps up with the cool, chuggy instrumental Nightmare, which they bafflingly decided to spell correctly. Again, this EP probably won't blow your mind or anything, but it is super solid with catchy tunes and some really nice guitar. Nightmare also put out a demo in 1989, but it's so obscure, I can't even find out who appeared on it. Regardless, Nightmare broke up shortly after this, although Jürgen, Ergen, and Hani would join the band Salvage, where they appeared on their single self-titled album in 1991. Number 5, Alien. Alien from New York City was formed in 1982 by guitarist Rick Christie, bassist Damien Bardot, and vocalist Frank Starr. They'd also bring on drummer Roxanne Harlow and second guitarist Brian Fair. They'd put together a 1982 demo which would get them signed to New York indie label Mongol Horde, who released their one EP, Cosmic Fantasy, in 1983. Despite the band name, their sci-fi look, and the spacey intro track on the EP, Alien mostly leans into a more hard rock sound with a title track that reminds me a lot of new wave of British heavy metal band, Holocaust. We, we have a unique style. It's its own. It's metal, but you know, it's, we don't really sound like anybody. You know, everybody sounds, sounds like, like alien. It sounds like alien. And yeah, 
Now, bizarrely, the title track is on here twice, the exact same song as tracks two and six. But anyway, track three, Star Lover, is along the same lines as the first track with a pretty lively riff and some nice guitar playing. And track four, Headbangin', gets a little more aggressive, but still maintains a pretty similar feel. But then the solos come in and take the whole thing up a notch. However, the highlight on this EP for me is easily track five, Don't Say Goodbye which is actually a duet between Frank and Roxanne. It's very poppy, obviously, but I dig it. And if Alien had broken out, I think this would have been a bigger song than Cosmic Fantasy. But unfortunately, Alien would break up the following year, despite largely positive feedback to the EP. And as promised, one bonus entry, Child Saint and their controversial 1988 single. Child Saint from Orange County, California was formed in 1984 by guitarists Brian Scott and John Spector and their manager Rick Rail. After holding auditions, they'd also bring on bassist Steve Harden drummer Gary Schultz, and vocalist Rudy Gray. This lineup of Child Saint would record a four-track demo in 1985. The demo overall is really solid, with a mix of US power and British metal vibes, like Made of Metal, which goes seamlessly from high energy riffing to a slower, doomier chorus. the catchier track to die in the sun with a bit of an early Iron Maiden feel. The 
thick bass and tight drumming add a ton of heaviness to the tracks, and there's some really sweet soloing to tie it all together. Along with an instrumental, The Voyage, this demo also contained the self-titled track, Child Saint. If you think that opening riff sounds like the riff on Rust in Peace by Megadeth, you're right, because it actually is that same riff. As the story goes, John Spector and Brian Scott were jamming buddies with Dave Mustaine back in 1981, when Dave was in a band called Panic. Dave had written the riff along with a few lyrics attaching the title Child Saint, but since his current band wasn't into the riff and it was unfinished anyway, Dave told John that if he could make a song out of it, he could have it. So John and Brian rewrote the lyrics and finished out the track, which ended up as Child Saint. The demo would actually get played on local radio, which Dave happened to be listening to. I heard a song on the radio, and I'm going, fuck, that sounds like me, because I know what my style sounds like. And I'm going, that really sounds like me. And all of a sudden I went, holy shit, this is a song I wrote six years ago. Obviously I can't speak for anyone involved, but it sounds like things were essentially smoothed over with Dave calling John and requesting a co-writing credit. But on the whole, Child Saint has more in common with British metal than speedy West Coast thrash like Megadeth. And aside from the opening of Child Saint, there's little chance of getting the two bands confused. After playing their first live show, Rudy would leave Child Saint and be replaced briefly by John Russell, before vocalist Bob McCormick would take over in February of 1987. Along with his broad vocal range, Bob brings an in-your-face New York attitude to the proceedings, and the musicianship has also noticeably improved from the demo three years prior. This lineup would be spotted at the Troubadour in Los Angeles and get picked up by Pasha Records to record the 1988 single, Child Saint. Feel the anger and the wrath of the God you The sound quality is better than the demo, obviously, but the song itself is largely the same, although it's a bit tighter and the solos are cleaner.
The B side, I Am Future, is a bit on the slow side for me with an overall doomier tone. That said though, I think the solos are still pretty great, although I have no idea what Bob's doing in the back there. Child Saint would spend 1988 headlining and opening for bands like Racer X, Saxon, and Sabotage. Then, in early 1989, Bob McCormick would leave and be replaced by Tim Winchester. <laughs> Tim feels like a really good fit for the band's style, with his ability to handle both soaring power metal vocals as well as the grunty, thrashier side. Child Saint would disband in 1991, with everyone going on to different projects. But in 2022, the band released Anthology, containing material with all three singers, including the 1985 demo, the 1988 single, and additional tracks with Tim Winchester, like Blood for Gold. There's also a CD of live recordings and a full concert DVD included, so I'd recommend giving it a look, because frankly, many of these songs are better than either track from the single. it is, five 80s metal bands who only released one EP, and one who only released a single. Check them out and let me know what you think. I hope you liked them, but I know you'll let me know in the comments. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.